Good evening. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Tim Hanser. This is Thinking Green. Tonight's uh, Tuesday, January 3rd, 2017. Uh, today was the first day of the session in Washington for the new Congress. So there's been a lot of talk already about what, what's going to happen with this new Congress and a new president. But tonight what we're going to talk about is what's going on with the state budget. There's uh, a lot of challenges that the state of Connecticut is facing, and their session starts tomorrow. Uh, so tonight we have, uh, with, with me, I have Jonathan Pelto, who's a former state representative from the town of Mansfield. He was a rep for 10 years, um, who's going to talk to us a little bit about the budget situation in, in Hartford and uh, what challenges we face as a budget, as a state. W welcome, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be back on the show and to talk about this really important issue that's going to be uh, taking a lot of attention, um, you know, it's understandable that all eyes are on Washington right now and the daily debacle of what, uh, what uh, President-elect Trump has tweeted and uh, what more damage he's done and, and the next billionaire that he's appointed to his cabinet and whether the United States Congress is capable of doing anything at all. Um, but as you said, uh, the attention is going to begin to shift, at least in part, or should shift, at least in part, back here to Connecticut, where Connecticut is facing an extraordinary uh, budget crisis. Uh, in some ways, it's probably the, the, the biggest crisis we've faced since, uh, since Governor Malloy took office in 2011. Well, when he became governor, he talked about the fact that he was inheriting a $3.7 billion budget deficit thanks to Governor Rell and the Democrats who had spended, spent significantly more money than we had and didn't want to face up to the reality of coming up with the revenue. Uh, that has led to two major tax increases uh, in his first year and then once he was reelected, uh, along with some significant cuts. And yet we're looking at a budget shortfall of well in excess of a billion dollars. And if we look at the next two years, uh, we're closing in on a, a budget shortfall in excess of what he inherited when he took over from Governor Rell. So the Democrats have, have uh, facing a particularly difficult time here in Connecticut. And at the same time, the Republicans have picked up a number of seats. The state Senate is now 1818. Uh, with uh, at least two or three of the Democrats being uh, conservative Democrats who have voted against uh, uh, tax increases in the past. And so it's going to be very hard to get a budget passed through the Senate. Uh, as in, in the House, it's down, I believe, to four seats now uh, difference. And so if you just had a shift of a few legislators, you'd have the same situation in, in the State House of Representatives. So Governor Malloy puts his budget on the table in mid-February with his budget address, uh, and the legislature gets down to business. They're supposed to have a budget in place by the beginning of June, but I think a lot of people are, would be surprised if that happens, would be surprised even if they can get a budget together before the beginning of the new fiscal year, uh, because this budget is going to require major tax increases and budget cuts, and even then it's hard to see how they put a budget together that would garner enough votes to pass both the state senate and the state house yeah it's wow that's uh that's it's it's a real concern i mean it this is um it's a big hole we're in and i think what uh, a lot of people don't really understand is how do we get here how do we get here i mean this is connecticut is the wealthiest or one of the wealthiest states in the union it's been one of the wealthiest states in the union for so many years it seems uh, seems implausible but that the state can be kind of teetering on on the brink of maybe not bankruptcy but certainly uh insolvency um, so wh how did we get here? How did this happen? Well, we, we got here in part by, even though we adopted an income tax in 1991, uh, since then, for the most part, when we had extra money, instead of putting it aside, uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, but particularly during the Republican years, sought to cut taxes. Uh, the other thing they did was they went from a relatively progressive system to one that is more regressive in nature. You know, most of us sort of uh, are brought up thinking that the American tax structure is supposed to be progressive. That is, the more you make, the higher percentage you pay on your income, the less you make, uh, the lower percentage. Uh, I brought some slides along today that uh, highlight some of the issues, but the first and, and perhaps most fundamental issue is that Connecticut has a tax structure uh, that while taxes are high in certain areas, such as the local property tax, they're relatively low in other areas, including on the income tax, especially for upper income area, uh, people. So in Connecticut, rather than having a progressive income tax or a progressive tax structure, when you combine state and local taxes together, 
we actually have a structure that's regressive. That is, the wealthiest uh, in the state pay about five, five and a half percent of their income in state and local taxes. The middle income uh, folks pay about 10 percent and the poor 12 percent. So when you add state and local taxes together, we actually have a regressive tax structure. And that means that there's a lot of people, particularly at the wealthy end, who just aren't paying their fair share. And the burden has shifted more and more to middle and low income people, particularly middle income people, by relying on uh, the property tax. And so what the legislators are going to be faced with is the choice between raising the income tax, particularly on upper income folks. And Governor uh, Malloy has made it clear through his years that he doesn't want to raise taxes on the wealthy. He said in a speech in, 19, in 2011 to the legislature that he was going to raise taxes but basically exempt the wealthy from having to pay more. And his rationale was that he didn't want to uh, punish success. So it's very much of a sort of a, a, a Bush uh, tax cut or a uh, even now in the new era with a Trump uh, tax approach, and that is this belief in somehow trickle-down economics that if we just coddle and reward the wealthy, they'll end up making more and they'll then produce more jobs and, and uh, we shouldn't ask them to pay their fair share. So this year we're going to be facing this massive uh, tax uh, and revenue shortfall and a budget that just doesn't balance and Malloy has said that he doesn't want to raise taxes. Understandable in the political world, uh, particularly coming from a governor who's the least popular governor in the United States or second least popular governor, depending on which one you pick. Um, and yet he's got a problem where if he makes the kinds of cuts he's, he's going to try to make, uh, that will not only destroy a lot of services but alienate a lot of people. So he's backed himself into a corner. The legislature has backed itself into a corner. And we're now going to be dealing with a, a budget crisis of, of relatively unparalleled uh, 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 amounts. So, so before we kind of talk about um, you know what the what the potential changes may be, let's talk a little bit about what does it look like right now. What what's driving these deficits? What are the deficits? Uh, what are the tax burdens currently? Because I think knowing where we start is is kind of kind of lets people know where we may end up heading. Because I, I would say that anybody who's been paying attention does not see a, a rosy a rosy future for That's the state right. of Connecticut unless some some serious uh, decisions are made. That's right. The the uh, what's happened in the last uh, since Governor Malloy took office is while we have had two big tax increases, uh, he has shifted uh, the the pendulum. He called it shared sacrifice. In fact, uh, there were some uh, key constituencies that sacrificed a lot more than others. But this chart that's up on the screen now shows the magnitude of the problem. And that is, uh, despite uh, one of the things, one of the problems that we've had is that Malloy and, and politicians in general have just not wanted to, to be honest with the, the public, particularly before elections. And so before Governor Malloy's reelection uh, two years ago, he said there was no budget deficit. Within 10 days after the election, he announced that, in fact, there was a deficit and it was a fairly big one and getting worse. Uh, we didn't learn our lesson in, in uh, uh, not uh, believing politicians this time around, up, right up till November. Malloy and the Democrats claimed there was no deficit, and again, within 10, 12 days of the election, they announced that the deficit uh, had grown to $50 million, $100 million, and they started making cuts. Um, I think most reasonable projections are that this year's budget deficit is going to end up somewhere between 100 and $500 million. I think even the most conservative estimates are that it will be in the 100 to $200 million uh, level. The fact is that it could be even higher than that. Uh, the reason that that becomes important is you know, if we have a deficit this year, it uses up the rest of the rainy day fund, meaning we go into this coming storm with, no, with nothing left in the rainy day fund. We've used up the rainy day fund in the last three years. Uh, it wasn't built up nearly as large as it should have been, but uh, even what money was there has been siphoned off to try to reduce deficits each year. One of, the, one of the sad commentaries is that we've had a deficit every year since uh, the Democrats took control of the governorship and maintained control of the legislature. And part of the problem has been there's just been an unwillingness to, to come to grips with uh, where are you going to come up with the revenues to fund what is a budget that has been relatively uh, flat funded and cuts in certain areas. The big problem comes next year uh, where the projections are we're looking at a $1.3 billion uh, 
uh, shortfall in the year after that, at least to 1.4, 1.5, maybe as high as 1.6. Uh, so together we're uh, looking at uh, well into the over $3 billion shortfall. And that means that we're going to have to come up with significant amounts of revenue and make significant cuts. And so the, the, the political pandering that has already been taking place of uh, talking about wanting to not go with any kind of tax increases or limit tax increases, again, it's understandable a politician would be saying that, uh, but, but the problem is they need to be a lot more honest with the public, and that is if we don't have tax increases, we're looking at cuts unlike any that Connecticut has seen, certainly in modern history. Wow. So yeah, it's uh, so I'd like to go a little further into kind of what 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 is really the cause for these cuts and and where you know where does the state spend its money? Um, I think th this 1.3 billion dollar number, this 1.4 billion dollar number, those are big numbers. But without context, it's right. uh, I don't think it's it's understandable by the general public what that really means. I mean, if it's 1.3 billion out of a out of a trillion dollar budget, this is you know a lot less to be worried about than if it were a 20 billion dollar budget. So let's talk right. a little bit about kind of what's in the state budget and how the state budget's uh, spent. And and uh, there are really two kinds of expenditures. The the budget itself is in the range, as you point out, is about 20 billion dollars. So uh, having a 10, 10, 12, 14 percent uh, shortfall is is significant. That's not the kind of thing that you can simply solve by having. Uh, some minor cuts and build in some efficiencies. This year, the governor uh, and the legislature proposed cutting the state employee uh, number of state employees by 2,000. They were only able, or Governor Malloy was only able to identify about 1,000 that he laid off. Uh, didn't go above that point because of the amount of damage that it would do, or the fact that there are cuts in areas that you just can't, you just can't cut because the ramifications are so severe, including the loss of federal funds. So it's relatively easy to talk about, let's just tighten our belt, but when you're talking about a budget that is off by a 10 or 15 percent, the question then comes, where do you cut? On top of that, and, and uh, the chart, uh, I have a couple of charts here that I can show, uh, only about half the budget um, is what would, we would call... Uh, can we get that next slide up on the screen? The, uh, only about half can the budget... next slide, please? Thank you. There we go. Uh, the Connecticut state budget, so it's in the range of, of the $20 billion. It's a little bit less on the general fund side, and there's a little, uh, some additional funds that's spent in the transportation fund, but right. together they're in the range of $20 billion. And about half of that amount is, uh, is what we would call fixed costs. Those are costs that it is virtually impossible uh, to, to, to cut, uh, which means that you're looking at a billion plus in a $10 billion budget. Um, which is where you get the kind of 10%, 15% cuts that you would really need. Um, the next slide gives you a sense of where those um, fixed costs are. Um, that is Medicaid, those are federal dollars that uh, pass through the state of Connecticut. The federal government gives us 50 cents for every dollar that we spend on Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid, for example, uh, is one of the biggest items is nursing home costs. There are a variety of other health care costs for the poor. Uh, there are areas that you could cut there, but the problem is for every dollar you cut, you lose 50 cents in federal spending. Now, it could be that that will change some under uh, a Trump administration if he cuts the states. On the other hand, uh, one of the areas that you want to be careful about cutting is if you simply cut a Medicaid dollar, not only do you reduce those services for people, um, but you actually then lose federal money. And as the chart shows, there's a variety of other things. Debt service, that's what we are forced to pay, the minimum payment on our credit card that we have to pay uh, every year, uh, state employee pension costs, which we have to pay, teacher pension, and then state employee and teacher benefits, and there's some other entitlements. But uh, what the chart means is that roughly half the $20 billion absolutely has to be spent. That is, we don't either, we have the, neither the legal ability uh, to cut that, nor uh, if, if we do have the legal ability as, as we could in Medicaid, the damage to the state would be so great that it would actually be counterproductive, uh, which then leaves the areas where we can make cuts, and that's the other 50 percent of the budget, about nine, nine billion dollars. So in fact, when you hear that the shortfall is in the range of 1.3, 1.4 billion dollars, you really are it's looking really at a 14, 15, 16 percent shortfall. 
Uh, we can cut state employee, uh, the number of state employees. Uh, uh, the governor can lay people off with the approval of the legislature. Um, but as I said, they've had difficulty finding uh, which services to cut without doing significant damage. Uh, and of course, any impact in salaries or benefits requires that to be negotiated with the uh, state employees. And so what we'll see this year is when, when we have this shortfall, this $1.3 billion shortfall, that assumes that there will be no raises uh, whatsoever already. So in fact, this problem could get bigger uh, the governor has uh, has said to the unions he wants them at the at the bargaining table. There has been discussions between the unions uh, and the Malloy administration. Um, but the problem that is facing both sides is that even if they give up all raises, which is unlikely considering the fact that they've already given up raises in the past, and and uh, if they give them up or if they give up part of only part of those raises, then in fact we'll see the size of the deficit grow even more. Uh, the second biggest area is aid to cities and towns, and we saw the governor for the first time in his tenure go after that. He cut $50 uh, million, uh, announced $50 million cuts uh, to the uh, last week to cities and towns, $20 million of that directly to schools, $30 million to cities and towns. This budget, when we hear the $1.2, $1.3, $1.4 billion shortfall, that assumes no increase in spending. So already as we have school budgets going up, local budgets going up, uh, the problem is that it's easy to say we don't want to raise taxes at the state level. It just means the taxes are going to go up at the local level because those costs are being increasingly shifted from the state uh, down to the municipalities. And so the budget problem is, is severe as it is, but it will get even more severe um, if, if we uh, don't deal with the fact that the budget already assumes no salary increases and no increases in uh, in cities and towns. And then the other areas that uh, cuts can be made, uh, uh, public higher education, the governor has already uh, produced the largest cuts to our public colleges and universities in history. Uh, we've seen tuition going up at six, seven, eight percent per year, um, the uh, tuition doubling in the last uh, 10 years. Uh, so again, it, 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 you can say, well, let's cut it at the state level, but that means it's shifting to Connecticut's families and disproportionately hitting middle-income families that are already facing uh, large tuition bills. And then the Votech High Schools, the very mechanism that we build our, our workforce or part of our workforce for the future, and the governor has gone after that uh, constituency with major cuts and is likely to again. And then all of the other functions of government, environmental protection and ethics and all of the things uh, that people know government as, Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, the question is, what cuts are people willing to uh, to right. take in that area? So let, I want to kind of um, stop at the aid to cities and towns. I think because I think that's the one that uh, is most tangible for for a lot of people. Um, this process happens not in a vacuum, and at the same time that the state is developing their budget, the cities and towns of Connecticut are developing their budgets as well, and this creates a lot of uncertainty for them because the likelihood of the state having a budget in advance of the towns having their budgets is it's just it's not going to happen um, like you said june june is when when the state will likely will hopefully have their budgets uh, approved um, towns generally have their budgets approved in in may um, sometimes as late as june um, so I want to speak a little bit about how does that how does that impact towns in terms of their decision making not only for this current year but but how do they make decisions kind of for the midterm and for the long term with this uncertainty? Right, and and part of it is that the the two systems seem to be relatively separate, and that is state politicians, state officials working on the state budget, and state legislators going to Hartford to vote on the state budget are fond of being able to call home and say, look, this, this is the amount of money that I've got, but it's almost an after-the-fact kind of thing, as you point out, that the towns are left trying to guess, are we going to get about what we got last year? Are we going to get a little bit more? Are we going to get a little bit less? Uh, this year, uh, I think it, it's unfortunately going to be significantly less. Uh, the, the last few budget cycles basically have said, well, we'll hold cities and towns harmless, meaning we won't give you a lot more money except for a handful of poor towns that have gotten some money in education, although, although not very much. Uh, so towns like New London and Hartford and Bridgeport and New Haven 
um, have gotten just a pittance uh, with the rest of the towns uh, being flat funded. This year we're likely to see for the first time a significant reduction in municipal aid. How big that reduction will be will de be depend on a couple of factors, but I think the biggest factor will be whether or not state legislators and the governor are willing to increase taxes at the state level. And of course, traditionally, they, they don't want to, uh, at least politically, they don't want to increase taxes at the state level. We have a governor who says taxes are off the table. We have, as we've said, a legislature that's very split with Republicans saying no tax increases and a group of Democrats likely joining with Republicans in opposing tax increases. And so the problem with that is that makes the cuts to cities and towns that much larger. Right. And in the past, uh, most state politicians have not had a time where they have been cutting cities and towns. They don't have that experience. Uh, they may have the experience of not giving cities and towns more money, but they can go back to their cities and towns and say to their town council and their board of education, well, I didn't get you more money, but at least you're getting what you got last year. One of the dynamics is going to be how does a city and how does a city or town put together a budget when the, when the possibility is as much as a five or even ten percent cut in municipal aid. So in addition to all of the other pressures that the city and town is facing, having to deal with uh, salary increases both in the school system and at the municipal level, they'll have to go through negotiations with their municipal employees about givebacks or freezing salaries or how do they deal with salary increases. Uh, the regular costs of inflationary costs, uh, one of the things that the state uh, has been fond of doing is simply saying, we want you to have all of these programs, but we're not going to give you any inflationary increase. So little by little, those programs become one or two or three or four percent more expensive every year. So this year, I think what we're likely to see is unless legislators feel tremendous pressure from their local uh, uh, voters and from their municipalities, unless municipalities really engage in heavy lobbying of their legislators, the legislators are going to say, I, I, I'd like to get you more money, but I can't. I'll try to stop the cuts. I'll try to reduce the cuts when, in fact, uh, at the same time when they're saying, I'm not going to vote for any tax increases at the state level, they're really condemning the cities and towns to cuts that are, that are literally unprecedented. Uh, cuts that like we've never seen in Connecticut um, and cuts that are going to have a dramatic impact in reducing local budgets and also forcing up local property taxes. And so for Democrats, I think, and, and Republicans, that's something that they really need to look in the mirror about because we know the property tax is very regressive. It hurts middle-income people, the poor, more than anybody else. And so by saying, I don't want to increase the income tax on the wealthy or I don't want to increase the income tax, what they're really saying is, therefore, I'll allow the property tax to go up and go up significantly back in my city or town. So, so obviously, these impacts are not are not even are, are not evenly felt across across all the cities and towns in the state. Who who's really most vulnerable? What areas of the state are most vulnerable to to the changes in state aid? Yeah, I think it's I think it's the uh, middle-sized suburban towns that are going to receive some of the heaviest hits. The way that the formulas work, is, as you know, the money disproportionately uh, is based on helping towns that that don't have uh, the resources. So if the poorer towns get a larger share, the wealthy towns get a relatively small share, and the middle towns are, have been the ones that uh, the, the suburban towns around. Hartford, around New Haven, here in uh, southeastern Connecticut, uh, uh, they're likely to be hit fairly hard because what the Democrats and the governor will do is try to put in some kind of process to, to reduce the damage to the poorest towns. Now, those towns are so dependent on state aid that they still get hit and hit hard. And so with this latest cut, $20 million to education, the governor's uh, proposed uh, putting in, a, a, in essence, a circuit breaker. That is, no town would lose more than $250,000. But for New London to lose $250,000 in the middle of the school year is still a significant amount of money. It's not like that uh, can easily be uh, taken care of by minor cuts here and there. And so when we say uh, that, that wealthy towns will probably be relatively okay because they get relatively small amounts of state aid, Poor towns, there will be an effort to try to keep them from being damaged too much. On the other hand, uh, they're so dependent on that aid, they're, they're likely to see significant cuts, even though the cuts will be uh, 
uh, stopped a little bit at the upper end. And then these suburban uh, middle class towns are the ones that are likely to be hit uh, proportionally the hardest. And those are towns that send Democrats to Hartford for the most part. And so it will be interesting to see what those Democrats do when their towns are the ones that are getting hit particularly hard. The urban legislators are going to successfully say, look, we, we just can't take those cuts greater than uh, a relatively uh, small amount, uh, relative again being a, a relative term. Um, but then Democrats saying, well, wait a minute, um, I'm for budget cuts, but I'm not for that budget cut. Right, yeah, and, and Mayor Luke Bronin of, of Hartford really has taken his his uh, plight to the road, and he's he's engaged just about every town in the in the um, Hartford region to basically explain how Hartford really is in is in very difficult financial straits, and that any cuts are really going to be damaging not only to Hartford but to the surrounding region. So it'll be very interesting to see how it seems like he's been building bridges uh, with his uh, suburban neighbors. It'll be very interesting to see how that impacts. Um, these discussions That's as well. Right, right. I mean, it, you know, it's 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 relatively easy for those towns to sit there and hear from uh, Hartford that you know we're in dire straits, we're on the verge of insolvency, we want to explore the concept of bankruptcy, all of the things that that we would never want to have happen in most towns. And Hartford is saying things are so bad that we're going to have to consider going that route. It's a relatively easy thing to sit there and listen to that and nod your sure. head until you start losing significant amounts of money too. Uh, and so the idea that uh, uh, you know I'm I'm willing if I'm in a suburban uh, Hartford town, East Hartford, uh, Weathersfield, Rocky Hill, West Hartford, Bloomfield, Windsor, uh, those towns are saying, well, wait a minute, um, I was willing to have those discussions until I found out that my town is going to get cut, and you don't understand because in my in this town we we need those dollars too. Uh, so it will be, it will be uh, I think there will be very heated discussions. Uh, there will be an attempt to try to um, probably limit some public uh, awareness of just how bad things are. Um, there will be proposals that are made behind closed doors that they'll try to get the votes before they announce what the proposal mm -hmm. actually is uh, because this is one of those situations where the more the voters know, uh, the unhappier they're going to be, and of course there's going to be a real incentive to try to keep voters from, unfortunately, keep voters from knowing the truth as right. opposed to laying it all out on the table. Um, and we've been talking just about the short-term budget, that is, how do you balance a budget for, for this coming year or two years? Uh, Connecticut has an equally large, if not larger, problem in the amount of debt that it has, and there has been talk of uh, it's time to confront that debt. Uh, there was a proposal, or there is a proposal, uh, that has been agreed to between Malloy and the unions to sort of uh, drop kick some of that debt uh, onto our children, but that only is the tip of the iceberg of the amount of debt that we carry as a state, both both uh, bonded indebtedness, that is the good debt that we use to build schools right. and roads and all of the good things, but then tremendous unfunded pension liabilities for state employees, for teachers, and then the biggest one of all is the unfunded liability for health care for retired uh, state employees and retired uh, teachers and how we're going to fund those. And none of that is, is related to this discussion about the size of the budget. Uh, we probably carry as a state uh, about, we have about 70, 75 uh, billion dollars in debt. Uh, we're the most indebted per capita state in, in the country. Um, no, no other state or virtually no other state has the kind of debt problems that we have. We're not on par yet with Puerto Rico or Greece, but we're more like Puerto Rico and Greece than we are. Without the nice weather. Without, without, the, good, without the good weather. And um, we, we could spend um, uh, an entire show and then some just talking about this, this magnitude, this gigantic uh, uh, iceberg that's in the, is in the future of Connecticut. Um, if we uh, go down. Uh, yeah, I think let's let's talk a little bit about um, the the indebtedness issues, um, just to kind of give some scale to these. Uh, there's the, the the governor did come to an agreement uh, with the with the, the unions of just before Christmas to, as you said, to kind of kick some of these problems down the road a little bit. Um, it provided him with some very short term flexibility without really addressing the problem. So. Uh, I think on this, up on the screen you have kind of the list. Where does that fall in this list, and 
and um, let's talk a little bit about what else is on this list. Sure. Yeah, so on, on the list are the major areas of long-term state obligations. So as I had said, it's a $74 billion uh, that, that we owe um, and we owe to, the, to uh, that we're going to have to pay and we're going to have to pay these costs within the next uh, 20 to 30 years, most of them. And so uh, imagine, I suppose, the, the analogy is this is our mortgage that we've, we've bought this house, uh, we have this house, uh, and we owe this money, and the question is, are we going to pay it a little bit every year, or, or, and what happens if we don't pay enough? Um, the bonded indebtedness, that is the first one, uh, which I call the good, the good debt. We got, we got something for that. We got buildings. We got state parks. Uh, we, uh, some of it is uh, used in more controversial ways. Um, when the governor has his corporate welfare program to give big companies monies uh, to stay in Connecticut, he uses borrowed money. It's in essence our credit card. And imagine uh, some of the people, older people in the audience will, will remember there was a time where virtually every day uh, a letter would come that says, you qualified for this credit card and will have 0% mm. interest and you can, uh, you, you can borrow up to $25,000. And many of us fell for that and got multiple credit cards and, and uh, are still paying. Uh, from the 80s and 90s where everybody was given a credit card. In essence, this is what happened to Connecticut, that we, we put a lot of stuff on our state credit card. And so the first one on the screen of $23 billion, that's the, that's the amount. And, and Malloy has borrowed significantly more money than previous governors. And what we've seen is the percentage of the budget that's going towards paying that minimum monthly payment is going up and will continue to go up. And so that's something that uh, reduces uh, our flexibility and something that is going to definitely have to be paid off. The other areas are the ones that are far less known. That is state employee pensions. Uh, that's what we owe. Is we should have been putting money aside. Uh, the state empl employee pension program, the one that uh, we actually have four different tiers. We have tier one, tier two, tier two A, tier three. Uh, tier uh, one was the one that was put in place before there was even unions in the state of Connecticut. So it's not something that uh, people can blame unions for, although some Republicans try to do that without understanding. And that was the, the somewhat more generous uh, pension program, uh, uh, different than Tier 2, Tier 2A. Tier 2A, which is what most state employees are now, the Tier 1, almost 97%, I think, of Tier 1 people have retired. already retired. Right. And so when you hear people say, well, we need pension reform, the problem is the people who were collecting the bigger pensions, they've already retired and there's really no legal way that we can change that pension uh, going forward. The uh, state employee pensions in Tier 2 were already the least generous in New England and Tier 3, the new tier that we now have, is the least generous pension program in the country. So we've already had pension reform and so again politicians are fond of saying uh, let's get rid of their big pensions, but in fact, the state employees that are uh, state employees now have relatively, and that is, you know, people can oppose pensions on their face, but you can't say that these are generous uh, pensions. The problem, though, is we didn't put the money aside for the pensions that we had. Um, and when we did have unions, uh, the unions and the state got together and said, and, well, we should be putting more money aside. Whenever there was a difficult budget year, both sides agreed to forego some of the pension payments. And so we owe roughly $15 billion, uh, and that is money that, as you can imagine, these people have already retired. So yeah, their okay. lifespan is tw 10, 20, uh, 30 years at the most, probably. Uh, since many of them are already in their 60s and 70s. And if, if I remember correctly, of that 15 billion, about 9 billion of that is for people who are already retired. They're already retired. So this is, they're doing, making any changes for current employees is not actually kind of putting the, putting the blame, so to speak, with the people who, who really benefited from, from these policies. That's right. That's exactly so, right. So, I mean, it's really mostly as people who are retired. This, this is a 30, 40 year old problem. And the 30 or 40 year old problem, and it's, it's as if, um, again, using that analogy, you bought the house, and for the first 20 years, you just didn't make very many uh, mortgage payments. And so, uh, the amount that you owe is getting bigger and bigger, and, uh, and, and that has to be paid. Now, the sad uh, reality is that this agreement, this much heralded agreement between Malloy and the unions, in which they postponed. Uh, much of those payments because they were going to be too large uh, for us to handle in the short term. The problem is instead of paying them between now and, and 2030, uh, 
they decided they'd pay him between 2030 and 2060. So we're talking about people who will have uh, collected their pension, be gone and, 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 uh, and, and in an afterlife someplace, and our children will be paying those pension liabilities that we should have been saving all along. Uh, so that's the state employee pension, a relatively similar uh, situation with the teacher pensions. Uh, and with teachers, of course, they don't, they're not allowed to collect Social Security. Um, as a way to save money, we said, we'll give you a pension. It will be a relatively small pension. It will be more than you will have gotten on Social Security. Um, but instead of that, you w we won't pay into Social Security, and you won't be able to collect Social Security. So again, it's, it's nice to talk about pension reform, but people don't understand that these teachers don't have any other option. And unlike all the other people in the country, they actually legally cannot collect Social Security because nobody paid into Social Security on their behalf. So we owe that money uh, another, another $14 billion. And then we owe close to $20 billion is what it will cost for all of the retirement health benefits uh, for these uh, state employees. And there's an area where theoretically you could negotiate with the unions over, um, but of course as, as negotiations go, it's a give and a take. And the question is, um, what, what is it that the state is willing to give in order to take back some of the benefits that it had promised? And even then, there are legal issues. These are the ones who have already retired, retired with a contract that guaranteed them certain rights and privileges. And what the courts have basically ruled is you can't, you, you, you can't go back on those contracts uh, without declaring bankruptcy. And while a city might be able to declare bankruptcy like Detroit did and like Hartford wants to, it's pretty clear that the courts are not uh, frowned upon the notion that a state can't go bankrupt because a state can always come up with more revenue, it just doesn't want to. So part of the problem and, and, and the reason that uh, these kinds of opportunities uh, need to take place is to talk with people is that we need a much more uh, uh, educated electorate so that they can say to their legislators, the status quo, the go along, get along approach that we've had simply isn't working that we're gonna, we are going to uh, destroy Connecticut's fiscal health, and we're going to do that uh, both for, for this generation and, and in many respects even worse for the next generation if we don't come to grips with these obligations that we simply haven't been paying. Uh, that, the, that the sheriff is coming knocking on the door saying you have to make your mortgage payments, you have to pay these, uh, these indebted uh, obligations that you have, and we've basically been saying we'll pay the bare minimum at most, and when we can get out of it, we'll get out of paying those as well. Uh, so one of the, th the, the truisms is the time has come for us to be honest with people and to come to grips with the fact that if we don't pay these costs, uh, we're going to lose the kind of state that we want to have. Right, and it, and it seems to me that this, these long-term obligations are really putting, putting a lot of pressure on the short-term problems that if we have short-term short shortfalls like we have had in the past, which have been solved by not putting into these systems, it seems like there's a temptation to, to kind of make these problems, these long-term problems, bigger that's to address right. these short-term problems. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's really very important for the general public to understand the implications of the short-term decision-making on the long-term. Uh, it's one thing to... Uh, to give yourself a tax break, but uh, you don't want to have to burden your grandchildren with, uh, with that decision. Yeah. This, this chart that I just put up puts, it, puts that very point into perspective. In uh, 2012, we were, we were spending um, uh, roughly $1.6 billion on debt service. That's that, that's that minimum monthly payment right. that, you know, you, it, it, if you don't have any money, at least you have to pay the minimum monthly amount. Um, but you really want to pay more than that because if you're paying the minimum monthly amount, that's going to go up. Um, because Governor Malloy and the Democrats and the legislature decided to use the credit card so much, particularly for this corporate welfare program, which they've spent over a billion dollars on, on, um, on aid to Bridgewater, uh, the largest hedge fund in the world, got uh, $50 million, uh, another uh, significant $220 million to Pratt, uh, to Sikorsky to uh, get them to build helicopters here in Connecticut. Each individual uh, one was spent as a way to try to lure a business here or keep a business here. And while individually some of them may have made sense, the problem with it is that it dramatically increased the amount right. of debt we had. We also have made some 
significant uh, improvements to our universities, which were great, um, but uh, we now have uh, new buildings and no programs to go into those. We, we spent a lot of money on a lot of good things, spent money on not so good things, but now our minimum monthly uh, 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 payment uh, on an annual basis has really skyrocketed, and we're going to see that continue to go up. And so that idea that if you borrow money and you borrow money and you borrow money, eventually you have to pay that money back. And by paying that money back, you're now using cash that is now no longer available for other things. And so as we cut services to some of the most vulnerable people in, in the state, um, and the answer question is, well, why are, how, ca how can a state do that? How can we go ahead and cut services to those kinds of people who need those services so much? And the flippant answer is, well, we have to pay our credit card, and, and in fact, we're going to have to be paying more and more on our credit card, so we're going to have less money to pay for those services unless we go ahead and raise taxes and, and deal with additional revenue. And of course, as most politicians just don't want to confront the fact that it's, it's, it's a, a zero-sum game, that if you're going to... If you're not going to make the cuts, you've got to raise the revenue. If you're not going to raise the revenue, then you've got to make the cuts. Yeah, and it seems like the, the step that, that may be going forward this year, or it, at least what we saw from the last week, is that they're, they're going to push these problems out to the towns and, and cities of the state. And as we saw, I mean, that, that, that's a huge chunk of, of these uh, non-fixed costs, but that's still not going to solve the problem, even if that got zeroed. That's right. And so solve two years of problems, and then we'd have the same problems again three years from now. That's right. And, and I think it's that, that the politicians and the elected officials see themselves as being either state elected officials or local elected officials. And, and what voters do is in local elections, they vote for their local officials, and then the lo next, two, next year it's the state election, next year is the local election. And they're almost going to have to get to the point where voters are going to have to hold all the elected officials accountable by saying, just because you're not a local elected official, I'm still going to hold you responsible for raising my taxes. Because if, if the legislature does what I think it's going to do, and that is it dumps the problem onto the cities and towns, then you'll see cities and towns uh, faced with, with a very difficult, if not impossible, choice. They can raise property taxes in places that property taxes can go up and can go up significantly, but there will be plenty of places like New London where, quite frankly, you just can't, you can't get blood out of a stone. You right. can't get much more out of the local property tax base uh, without causing even more problems. And so then you're left with uh, cuts to s local services, cuts to state services, all because that state politician said, well, I don't want to have to raise state taxes. And the answer should be, look, whether you're raising local, ta whether you're f causing local taxes to go up or you're raising state taxes, you're still responsible for coming up with the revenue needed to fund services. Right. The, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the debt service problem, and, and we're here to talk about the budget, but as you said, these, these problems go hand in hand. Um, I don't think there's a real understanding of just how bad Connecticut has become and when it comes to borrowing money. Uh, this chart shows that uh, we now have a negative rating uh, for our bond indebtedness uh, prior to 1975. Uh, we had the best rating and best of any state possible rating. Uh, and now 32 states, that the, the, the way the rating agencies work, that you hear about uh, whether it's good safe debt or not safe debt and how much money do you then have to pay for uh, an interest in order to borrow money. Uh, 32 states are now better than us. There are only two states that are worse than us. Uh, so we've really reached close to the bottom of the barrel. And, um, and the magnitude of that debt is that uh, <clears throat> even before this latest round of borrowing, uh, we're at the point where every man, woman, and child owes the state of Connecticut another $10,000 for the borrowing that's already taken place. Right, and I think this is an important detail. I mean, I, like you said, we're talking about the budget, but these really do feed the budget so so closely. Is if if our if our rating drops, our interest rates go up, right. which just means that that debt service payment goes up even further. This is and there's less money available for for services now, and some of like some of that debt service that you like you said was really for 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 positive things, for for improvements to our infrastructure, improvements to our to our public spaces. So this is not simply money being thrown after uh, frivolous projects. Uh, the majority of it's being spent on kind of fundamental 
services that government provides. That's right. And, you know, and if, if you want those services, if you need those services, then you have to pay for those services. And part of the problem, and it's at the federal level now, certainly with the new Trump administration, is this sort of promise that you can have it all. You can have uh, all the services you want uh, and lower taxes. And, and we know that that just doesn't, that doesn't work. I mean, it's been called any number of things, uh, supply-side economics, trickle-down economics. Uh, but what happens is if you don't have the revenue and you keep spending the money, you get huge deficits. Um, and while the federal government can just keep printing money, state governments and local governments can't. And so you just can't function with those kinds of deficits. And so we have now a president who promises that he's going to cut taxes, uh, puts a lot of pressure on uh, shifting costs from the federal government to the state government. The state government is now talking about shifting costs from the state government to the local government. Uh, and the downside is that that means that uh, services A are not going to be provided in the way that uh, they should be, that some services are going to be cut and important services are going to be cut. And then local property taxes are going to go up. And, and as we said at the start, uh, that tends to be very a regressive form of taxation. It, it hurts middle income and low income people more than it hurts the wealthy. <clears throat> and it goes back to that idea that Connecticut doesn't have a progressive tax structure. Uh, we should have a progressive tax structure. In fact, we have a regressive tax structure. The more you make, the lower per percentage of your income is paid in taxes. And so, it, not that it would pass the legislature, but I and others have proposed uh, raising the income tax on the wealthiest people by two percentage points. Uh, and most politicians have said, no, we can't, we can't do that. It would, it would uh, just raise taxes too much. The fact is, even if we raise tax, uh, the income tax rate by two percentage points on the wealthy, they'd still be paying less in Connecticut than they pay in New York, less than they pay in New Jersey, less than they pay in Massachusetts. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a believer that all taxes are bad. Taxes are what we have to pay for a civilized society. Um, but what's happened in American politics and in Connecticut politics is that any talk of taxes somehow makes you uh, persona non grata and that you don't want to talk about taxes for fear of losing the next election. And I, and I think we're likely to see that argument continue, particularly because of Donald Trump's approach of um, even though he's not going to be able to make that happen, uh, because as he cuts taxes, as he proposes tax cuts, then the national deficit will, will grow much larger. Um, but you can, you can unfortunately get away with that, at least in the short term, at the federal level, and you just can't do that right. at the state level. Well, if you look at the history of, of federal spending um, over the course of the last 40 or 50 years, what you have seen is as taxes have been reduced at the federal level, uh, what the one of the ways besides deficit spending that they have achieved their you know achieved any semblance of of sanity with their budgets is that they have been giving less and less money to the states right. and and the amount of money the state of Connecticut receives today is far less than it received from the federal government thirty years ago and so any any cuts in taxes in Washington do have that type of trickle down effect and and what we 're probably going to see in the state of Connecticut because while Malloy has been very good about it up until now, is that he will probably have no choice but to start starving the, the municipalities. That's right. And, and again, I mean, we, we could deal with it at the state level, but I think there will be so much pressure uh, not to on the state level that they'll turn around and say, we're going to do to the municipalities what the federal government has done to us. We're just going to reduce the amount of money that we give you. And remember that, that figure of the uh, $1.2, $1.3 billion shortfall, that assumes no increase right. in municipal aid and no increase in, in state employee salaries. If any of those things go up, then you'd have an even bigger problem. So you have to find cuts. Uh, this, this $50 million cut is going to have a real impact on cities and towns that the governor announced last week. He needs to find, that's $50 million, he needs to find, and the legislature need to find, $1 billion. So it, the, 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 the possibility of doing that, I mean, one would have to say there is simply no way that you can get that kind of savings, even if you were to dump all of the burden onto the cities and towns, which you just couldn't get away with doing. But people watching this show should know that when they hear uh, the state government saying, we're not going to raise taxes. What they should hear uh, that interpreted as is, if we're not going to raise taxes at the state level, 
that means we're going to raise taxes at the local, we're going to make the local uh, level raise those taxes. And that's something that then is done, uh, uh, as we said, on a very unfair basis yes, it's be because it's the homeowners that really pick up the, the major And it's the middle income the towns and the cities of the state that are really hitting the, facing that burden. Uh, places like Greenwich and New Canaan are not, uh, that's right. they're, they're not really, they're not relying on state revenue to begin with. And even any revenue they lose can be raised with uh, 0.1 mil rate increases, whereas places like New London would need a 2 to 3 mil rate increase to offset any real cuts from the state. Right, right. And that's sort of a best case scenario. Right. So we have about about eight minutes left. So I don't know where you want to, what would you like to talk about at this point? We can kind of continue down this road. We could talk about some potential solutions or talk about what what has been discussed for proposals this legislative session? Sure. Why don't we talk about three minutes? Three minutes. Okay. Why don't we talk about this? This what has been proposed? Okay. So there's so the state legislature does open tomorrow, but uh, they pre-file many of their bills, and some of them have been have been published, and there's been some discussion about them. And and to to the best of my knowledge, there are two that have uh, are, that are proposing any raising of revenue, and there are two that actually cut revenues. Um, the, the two that they're talking about raising revenue was the legalization of marijuana um, and as well as the re re uh, removing exemptions on certain items that are exempt from sales tax currently. And, and I, we, we exempt a whole lot of things from sales tax. We exempt food from sales tax. We exempt gasoline from sales tax. Uh, the gasoline uh, from sales tax is, is a, a little bit of a misnomer because we have a gas tax of 25 cents and then we have a wholesale gas tax which adds another 20 cents, 20 cents. So if they were talking about uh, removing the sales tax or, or applying the sales tax to gasoline, we'd see gasoline prices jump by uh, six and six, so you know about 12 to 15 cents. So and, that, and that's assuming that the price of, of the wholesale gas didn't go up. Didn't and go right up. now, prices are rising. And prices are rising, right. And, and, and in fact, it wasn't that long ago that we were looking at $4 uh, gallon of gas. And so, uh, again, we be cautious when we hear people say, take out the exemptions, because it's a question of what exemptions. On the other hand, um, there are some very strange exemptions. For example, uh, advertising, uh, public relations, and marketing are all handled differently. Some are taxed, some are not taxed. Right. Uh, and so if you call it one thing, then you don't pay sales tax, and you call it something else, and you do pay sales tax. Right. And but so the, the, but the, does it actually get us anywhere? Well, it gets it in the tens of millions of dollars. It doesn't get so, into so the hundreds of millions of dollars. We're, I mean, we're not even, when we see these numbers that are being talked about, 1.3 billion, it doesn't even move that 0.3. That's right. That's right. And so the problem is that you're left with uh, increasing uh, the, the income tax. If you just did it on the wealthiest people, it would probably raise around $400 million. So again, it doesn't even get you 50% of the way. It probably gets you about 30% of the way. If you raise the income tax across the board, a lower amount on middle income people, a higher amount on wealthier people, then you probably are looking at six or $700 million, and you begin to then get some of the problems solved. But that would take a lot of courage and a, a lot, uh, on the part of elected officials. Uh, you could go ahead and, and raise the income, uh, the, raise the sales tax for every point that you raise the sales tax. It's about three to four hundred million dollars that you get in, but we already have a six point three five percent sales tax. Uh, the notion of a seven percent or seven and a half percent sales tax is uh, hard to believe. Um, one of the things that they may do is again turn it to the cities and towns and say, if you want to, if you right. want to put on a sales tax, if you want to put on other taxes. Uh, th than, than you can. Um, but the problem really is, it's, it's a real problem. And then the, the reason that the marijuana is attractive is that it probably is good for two or three hundred million dollars, as is tolls on the highways is good for two or three hundred right. million dollars. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw either tolls or marijuana or both um, as a last ditch effort to try to grab some money um, for, to try to balance the budget. All right. Well, I think we're, we're out of time. Um, thanks to everybody for, for watching. I hope it was informative and uh, hopefully we can have Jonathan on again as this budget process progresses. Good night. Thank you.